Daniel was uh, the editor of the Harvard Law Review, which should tell you a lot about him. He has spoken at this conference four times previously. I remember one of his lectures sounded to me a lot like a, a law school classroom on how humans think about the big issues. Very intriguing. Um, you know, we were at that time having a hard time getting the scientists to open their minds to the large reality. And the lawyers are taught that, that how people think about big issues depends a lot on their spirituality and their cosmology. Very interesting lecture. One of his lectures was on, uh, on his defense of John Mack when Harvard was trying to uh, give him a hard time. Lawrence Rockefeller paid for that. I think they must be friends. I do recall uh, talking to him in the past about being uh, uh, running a round table at a State of the World Forum concerning uh, exopolitics policy. I don't know whether he's going to get into that in his talk on UFO conspiracies and UFO phenomenon, but let's welcome Daniel Sheehan. Thanks. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Uh, sorry about the, the short notice here that uh, John was unable to make it, so they came out and said, uh, is there an Irishman in the audience uh, that uh, might be willing to uh, fill in here? So uh, what, what I want to do in the, in the time that we have here today is I, I want to talk about the issue of, of conspiracy theory. Uh, and its relationship to the UFO phenomenon. Because one of the things that, that uh, I've noticed over the years uh, developing is uh, two, two trends uh, here in, in a lot of the meetings and other meetings uh, about this extraordinarily important subject. One is that there's been a, uh, uh, an intensification of people's concern about conspiracies in general because of the experience that people have had in realizing that the the UFO phenomenon has generated a, a massive cover-up on the part of the United States government and its relationship with other governments around the world. People have begun to open on to the realization that this type of conspiracy to silence uh, people and to conceal information from the general public is a rather generic uh, phenomenon with regard to the government. So people have begun to look into other types of conspiracies to determine what else it is that we might uh, not be being told by our government. A second phenomenon that I've noticed is going on is, is a, a, a greater and greater openness toward kind of a spiritual dimension of this, the extra dimensional uh, qualities of this. Uh, for example, yesterday the discussions about actually uh, the experience that, that beings have in between lives and uh, opening on to the past life experience. Th these are two interesting phenomena that have been uh, evolving over the years during these conferences about, specifically about the UFO phenomenon. What I want to do today uh, briefly is I want to address the former of these two, the, the conspiracy theory issue. Uh, as as uh, Don pointed out, I was retained back in 1994 by Dr. John Mack the uh, chairman of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School to represent him when uh, Harvard University uh, pulled him in front of a major a faculty committee at Harvard University and began to grill him about uh, his book. And it became evident to all the people involved in that that there was some type of a major effort going on to, to silence John to keep him from talking about this, to keep the, uh, his stature and status from lending additional credibility to this important issue. And, uh, for example, when, when uh, I was asked to represent him, I, I appeared with, with John at, uh, at one of the first of these hearings, and Dr. John Relman, uh, who was chairing the actual faculty committee, uh, just began to grill him uh, uh, and so I, I stopped Dr. Rahman. I said, excuse me, Dr. Rahman. I said, uh, can, you, can you tell us exactly what it is that we're doing here? 
Uh, why is it that this faculty committee has been organized? What is it that you're trying to achieve through these, uh, these interrogations of, of Dr. Mack? And, uh, and Dr. Relman, who was the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and a faculty member at Harvard University, he said, well, uh, when, when uh, Dr. Mack wrote this book, Abductions, uh, Human Encounters with uh, Extraterrestrials, said uh, many phone calls started coming to the, to the dean of the medical school. And there was the dean of the medical school sitting on the, the, the faculty committee right next to him. He said, and uh, people began to ask questions in these telephone uh, calls, and, and uh, the, the dean found that he was unable to really provide answers to them. So we thought that, you know, we'd gather together some members of the faculty and have a discussion with Dr. Mack and, uh, and be able to get the answers to these questions. So I said, uh, well, this doesn't look exactly like kind of a, you know, an informal meeting of some faculty members here. Here you are. What, the sound is gone? Okay. Uh, okay. Is there somebody? With, okay. Well, I'll, I'll I'll talk louder until they is they back. Okay. Good. Uh, so so the bottom line is uh, I said you know well if if that's what we're doing here uh, then who was it that made these telephone calls to you? And he got kind of startled and he looked around and he said well uh, actually I I don't think I'm at liberty to discuss that. And I said, well, if, if in fact, you know, that we're supposed to be here to answer the questions that they were asking in these telephone calls, well, what, what questions were they asking? And he said, oh, gee, I'm, uh, I don't think I'm at liberty to discuss that either. And so it began to become, it began to become clear that uh, somebody was making these telephone calls and something was happening here. And so that what's happened is uh, because of that, people have, have developed this theory that there was some of course, people say, ah, it's the government. The government called uh, to Harvard University, and they're trying to get this suppressed. Uh, and so that then people go on from there to say, oh, well, uh, then they, they remember that uh, right, right after this had all happened, uh, Dr. Mack was killed, was uh, run down by a, a car in, on the streets of London. And so people then go on to say that, well, not only was it the government trying to suppress him to begin with, but in fact, uh, they killed him in order to silence him. But what I want to point out is, is starting with this example that we have direct knowledge about, I want to open on to the larger question of the, the types of conspiracy theories that people have going because the, the fact of the matter is that it, it wasn't uh, the, the government of the United States that contacted Harvard University to try to suppress John. It turns out it was Time Magazine. And and in fact, it, John was not in fact murdered. That this was in fact a, a terrible, tragic accident. Uh, that uh, that he was run down by a drunk cab driver. You know, uh, Danny Mac was on the phone to me, John's son, within an hour of it of it having happened. And you know, I was the last one to speak with John as he was flying from the, at the airport to fly to London to do this major presentation he was doing on uh, T. E. Lawrence at Oxford University. And so I had talked to him, the last one to talk to him, and then I was on the phone within an hour or so after he was killed. And we had the person arrested, they were interrogated, they had uh, alcohol tests on him, he was drunker than a sailor, and uh, uh, it was terrible. But, uh, but it wasn't uh, a murder, it wasn't part of a conspiracy of any sort. But when you look back to this thing, you say, well, what was Time Magazine doing trying to suppress uh, John? And it, it turns out that this begins to open on to what the conspiracy is really all about because it, it, my having done many cases, I've, I've done a number of major investigations. I did the Karen Silkwood case investigation to track down who it was that killed Karen Silkwood and why they had done that. I ran the investigation against the Ku Klux Klan, the American Nazi Party down in Greensboro when they murdered six people down there. You know, I, I know how to investigate these things and I know how to differentiate between a real conspiracy and a fictional conspiracy. And in this particular case, it turns out that Time Magazine uh, hates Harvard University. Uh, more, more specifically, uh, Luce, Henry Luce, uh, who was the editor-in-chief of Time Life, hates Harvard University. He, he views Harvard University as the seat of the liberal ethic in Western civilization. And, 
in loose is a complete reactionary, like the neocons and stuff that we've had some experience with over the last six years now. But loose was a, 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 a reactionary and hated Harvard University, and so that they would, they would go after Harvard University on any, any occasion they could. In fact, it was time that, that sent the woman in to try to, uh, tr try to destroy the reputation of John Mack earlier. Yeah, but uh, when, when you begin to start to see what, what's actually happening here, if you probe deeper into it, you begin to discover what the contours and context of a real conspiracy looks like. And in this particular case, it turns out that you find out that, uh, that Henry Luce was not only a major reactionary, but it turns out that he was part of a cabal of people who were actually helping to support the rise of Hitler in Germany. That he actually was very much involved in helping to raise funds for Hitler between 1924 and 1928, a critical period in there. And it turns out that the people that were working with him included... George Herbert Walker. And people go, let me see now, George Herbert Walker. Uh, that George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush one, uh, turns out that's his father-in-law. And his father-in-law was one of the major uh, financiers of the rise of Hitler. And the people that he worked with included John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles being the man who went on to become the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And John Foster Dulles, uh, having been the uh, Secretary of State of the United States. So you start to then begin to see, wait a second, this is now getting complex again. Because as it turns out, uh, this cabal of extreme reactionaries are also involved in having attempted to overthrow the United States government, actually, back in 1932. It was actually an effort to generate a military coup against the Roosevelt government back in 1932. Uh, and now these are things that, that people have almost never heard about, but it becomes very important for us for this reason. Uh, because it turns out that the hand-picked editor-in-chief of Time Life, uh, picked by Henry Luce, was a man by the name of C.D. Jackson. And C.D. Jackson turns out to be the man named by Colonel Corso as his briefing officer. When Corso was put in charge of the technology that was taken from the wreckage at Roswell and uh, given the assignment of, of farming this equipment out to various major American corporations to attempt to capitalize on the technology that was recovered from the Roswell crash. And so we, we start to begin to see this extraordinarily interesting unfolding in front of us. Uh, because what, what I want to do today in the, in the brief time that we have together is I want to talk about uh, this, this conspiracy, set of conspiracy theories in the context of the UFO phenomenon. Because the cover-up on the part of the United States government of the reality of UFOs and the reality of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization like this is, without any doubt whatsoever, the biggest and the most important conspiracy that uh, exists uh, in, on our planet today and in our country. Uh, what, what I want to do is, before I address that directly, I want to use as an, another example of this uh, a discussion about what the second biggest conspiracy is. Uh, that we're all aware of. I think we probably all could think pretty clearly about what that is. In addition to the UFO phenomenon, the cover-up of the ETs, the, the biggest and the most central conspiracy in the history of the United States is the assassination of President Kennedy. And, uh, and people will, right immediately will say, yes, that's true. And as, as it turns out, I happen to be in a position to be able to speak quite directly to that. And so what I want to do today, given the fact that I was asked on short notice to talk with you, uh, I want to I tell you what it is that actually happened there. And I, I think it's about time uh, that, that this was clarified directly. Because what's getting ready to happen is in June of this year, just another couple months, you're going to, you're going to find something out that uh, is going to be quite shocking and startling to all of you. There is 
as we speak, an article being prepared by New Yorker magazine, uh, a 12,000 word article that's going to be published. Uh, and it's going to be, it's, it's being written right as we speak. It's being written by, a, uh, by, by two men, a man by the name of Jefferson Morley and David Talbot. And what they're going to be revealing is that in June of 1968, when Bobby Kennedy was killed at the Ambassador Hotel, there has now been discovered a photograph uh, that was taken within minutes of the killing of uh, three men standing in the lobby of the Ambassador Hotel, which included David Morales, Gordon Campbell, and Jorge Johandes. Now, this doesn't mean anything to you yet, but it turns out that uh, David Morales was, in fact, the shooter on the grass de Knoll in Daly Plaza on November 22nd of uh, 1963. And he was the, the, uh, the lead shooter in the triangular fire team that was trained to assassinate uh, Fidel Castro. And uh, Jorge Johandes was the head of the DRE, which is the Cuban uh, student group that Oswald got into the argument with on the street corner. In, down in New Orleans, the famous incident that had occurred down there. But it turns out that these three men were actually standing right in the Ambassador Hotel in the lobby within minutes after the killing of, of Bobby Kennedy. And a second uh, revelation that's in the process of being made very soon is going to be undertaken by Richard Billings. Richard Billings was the chief uh, staff writer for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. There are a, a series of major intense meetings going on uh, today, actually. They began yesterday and are continuing on to today, uh, in which uh, Dick Billings is participating, along with uh, Gaetan Fonzi, who is the chief investigator for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. They're in communication with uh, G. Robert Blakey, who is the staff, staff chief. They're now in the process of getting ready to reveal a second photograph, which shows in Dealey Plaza, within seconds before the shooting, uh, a photograph of uh, Rip Robertson and Grayson Lynch. And that's important because uh, Rip Robertson happens to be the fellow, let me tell you who Rip Robertson is and why it's so important that he's standing right there in Daly Plaza and you can see the picture of the president in Connolly's vehicle going right past him and you can see him tipping his hat like this just before the shots rang out. Uh, it turns out that the reason we know who he is is because back in June, uh, I, want, I want to take you together now back to June of 1963. This is now just a matter of a, a few months before the president was killed in Dallas in November of 1963. Uh, it turns out that Richard Billings was at that time the Miami bureau chief for Time Life magazine. And he received uh, a call and was told to go to the Miami National Airport. This is the night of June 8th of 1963. He went to the Miami National Airport, International Airport at midnight, was met by a group of men there and taken to what they call Corrosion Corner, which is this big corner where the, the covert flights come out of Miami. And he was put on an, air, an airplane, one of those seaplanes and flown with 10 men out uh, onto the ocean. They landed on the ocean and they disembarked and got onto a yacht, a large yacht. It was called Flying Ti the Flying Tiger too. It was owned by a man by the name of William Pauley. William Pauley turns out to be a very close friend of C.D. Jackson, who was in fact the editor-in-chief of Time uh, Life magazine. And that's why Billings was asked to go, because C.D. Jackson, the editor-in-chief of Time Life, wanted to have him on board uh, this yacht because they were, they were taking an assassination team uh, ashore that was going to make an attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro. And it turns out that the person who was in charge of that assassination team on that date from June 8th to June 10th uh, was in fact Rip Robertson. And 
when they'd, they'd put this team of assassins over the side in a, this rubber dinghy with a little mo silent motor on it to go ashore in Cuba. On the night of June 10th, they were on board and uh, the, the, the Dick Billings was standing there with William Pauley and a man by the name of John Marino. And they were griping about uh, John Kennedy and Bob Kennedy having ordered them to stand down from trying to assassinate Castro. Because as soon as Bobby and John found out uh, early in June that there was an assassination team that was put together to kill Castro, they gave the order to stand them down. And this, we know about this particular evening what occurred because when John Moreno was griping about the Kennedys and what SOBs they were and how rotten they were for trying to stop them from killing Castro, William Pauley turned directly to him that night on June 10th of 1963 in the presence of Dick Billings and the others and said, don't you worry, John, we're going to kill that motherfucker. And these are the people who know exactly how to do that stuff. This was the major assassination team that was put together uh, to kill Castro. And so what I want to do briefly is I want to tell you, unfold to you in detail how this whole thing happened so you can understand what it is that happened to the president and what happened to Bobby so you can understand what did happen and what didn't happen. And so you can see what the, the real contours of a conspiracy are like and what they're not like so that we can then use that as a template to evaluate what's going on here in the UFO field. What happened uh, in this instance is we, we, have, we have to go back to 1960 to understand this. That, is, as you recall, in June of 1960, Richard Nixon, who had been the Vice President of the United States for eight years under the Eisenhower-Nixon administration from 1952 to 1960, uh, Richard Nixon, in June of 1960, is, is nominated by the Republican National Convention to be the presidential nominee for the Republican Party. What he does is he contacts, uh, immediately within two days, he contacts Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes, uh, that before he'd become uh, basically a vegetable with nine-inch fingernails and all that, that, uh, that he had been, as, as many of you know, uh, he had been a, a major inventor, a very creative guy. He invented the Spruce Goose, which became the prototype for the C-5A cargo plane. Uh, and he had developed contempt for everybody in the Hollywood community and had just basically withdrawn and people didn't see him much anymore. Well, what happened is Howard Hughes actually became a major consultant to the National Security Agency that had been created by the National Security Act of 1947. Howard Hughes had, had a thing called the Summa Corporation and they, he invented major technological things for the National Security Agency. Uh, one of which was the Glomar Explorer that was able to pick up submarines off the bottom of the ocean in the C-5A cargo plane, etc. And in that capacity, he had become a friend, an associate at least, of Richard Nixon. Because Richard Nixon, in his capacity as the vice president under Eisenhower for eight years, chaired the 5412 committee. The 5412 committee is a special subcommittee of the National Security Council, which is in charge of covert operations. And so Richard Nixon, for eight years, chaired the Covert Operations Subcommittee of the National Security Council from 1952 to 1960. And in that capacity, he became familiar with uh, Howard Hughes. So immediately upon Richard Nixon uh, winning the Republican nomination for the presidency in June of 1960, Richard Nixon contacted Howard Hughes by secret telephone, contact that they have, a scrambled phone, and told Howard Hughes that Richard Nixon wanted Hughes to organize a political assassination team to assassinate Fidel Castro and Raul Castro and Che Guevara and five other men who had, as of January of 1959, overthrown the Batista regime down in Cuba and had established a revolutionary government. And Richard Nixon wanted them assassinated so he contacted Hughes and asked Hughes to do this and to keep it away from the office of the presidency. Don't let it track back here. You get that done. And Howard Hughes agreed to do that in June of 1960. 
Howard Hughes contacted one of his lawyers, at that time a comparatively young one of his lawyers, a man by the name of Robert Mayhew, and assigned Mayhew the responsibility of getting this done. Robert Mayhew, in turn, contacted a man by the name of Johnny Roselli in Las Vegas. You, you remember Howard Hughes owned, this, I think, the Sands Hotel or at that time, one of them, and, and uh, was there. And so Johnny, Johnny Roselli was the representative in Las Vegas for Sam Giancana, the Don of the Mafia in Chicago, who, as you know, are deeply involved in the casinos in Las Vegas. And so, so Howard Hughes's lawyer, Bob Mayhew, contacts Johnny Roselli and says, the president, they started referring to Nixon as the president already, because they said, well, there's this young pipsqueak kid from Massachusetts that's been nominated by the Democratic Party. This uh, John Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, whose old man has kind of bought him the nomination. And so everybody thought that, uh, that Nixon was going to win. So, so Bob Mayhew said to Johnny Roselli, you know, the president wants this assassination team put together. And uh, you guys, referring to the mafia, you guys have your own reason for wanting to get rid of uh, Castro. You know, they've, they've thrown out the Batista regime, who is your partner in the heroin trafficking. They've closed down all the gambling casinos, the prostitution houses and stuff all through Cuba. So you have your own reason for wanting to kill him. So the president would like you to do this. So Johnny Roselli goes back to Chicago and meets with Sam Giancana and tells him that Nixon wants this assassination team put together and Howard Hughes is going to be uh, authorizing this. So at that point, uh, Sam Giancana says, well, wait a second, if we're going to do this, if we're going to kill Castro, that's in Cuba, that's Santo Traficante's territory. And Santo Traficante is the don of the mafia in, in Cuba, now in exile in Tampa. So they go down and have a set of meetings. They have three meetings that take place uh, from June 15th to June 21st of 1960 uh, at the Fontainebleau Hotel down in Miami. And in the meetings are Sam Giancana, Johnny Roselli, Santo Traficante, and Robert Mayhew uh, are all there. There's an agreement in principle on the part of Sam Giancana and, uh, and uh, Traficante that in principle they'll, they'll go ahead and do this, but they want to make certain that this is coming from the president and not just a pipe dream of Bob Mayhew or, or Howard Hughes. And so they insist that some representative of the president come to the next meeting to confirm this. They have this next meeting and a man comes using the nom de guerre of Mr. Ed. It turns out this is Sheffield Edwards. Sheffield Edwards was the chief of security for the Central Intelligence Agency out of the Miami station uh, down, in, uh, down in Miami at JM Wave. He gives the nod to go ahead and do this. So what, what they did, what Sam Giancana and, and Santo Traficante did very wisely, what they did, they selected 15 gunmen who in fact were gunmen for, uh, for, uh, for Santo Traficante who had been gunmen that protected their casinos and their, their heroin trafficking, etc., who then, as of June of 1960, were working with the American Central Intelligence Agency in a, in a thing called Operation Mongoose, which was a covert CIA program supervised by Richard Nixon to attempt to overthrow the government of Castro. And they were running boats in and blowing up bridges and burning sugar plantations and poisoning uh, crops, etc. And this was, this was called Operation 40, was the code name for this. So what, what Santo Traficante did is he retained uh, to participate in this assassination team 15 men who were all anti-Castro Cubans who had worked for him uh, but were at the present time working for the CIA. So he could bring them in to participate in this assassination team and if anything happened that any one of them got discovered, the CIA would probably move in to try to protect them being revealed because they were afraid that it would look like it was the CIA doing this, which it turns out it was not as such. So they put this team together, the 15 of them, and they were called the S Force. S is in SAM, the S Force. There were 15 men on it, uh, the, the major shooter of which was David Morales. 
There was Rafael Chichi Quintero, Ricardo Chavez, Rolando Martinez. Uh, there were the Suez brothers. There were there were uh, three. There were 15 of these guys. Uh, Jose Posada Correa was one of the guys. Uh, they were all anti-Castro, rabid anti-Castro, right-wing Cubans, and uh, and they participated in this. What what was done is they spread these 15 men out in in five paramilitary camps that were based along the southwestern United States. There was one on, on Star Island, just off Florida. Uh, there was one on Swan Island. There was one in the Everglades. And there were two at Lake Pontchartrain, outside of New Orleans. And the, the 15 men were divided up among all five of these camps, so they were not in one place together. And what they would do is they would, would gather these men up in private planes and fly them to Fort Huachuca, in Arizona, and they would then disappear off the rolls uh, of being signed into Fort Huachuca, and then they would take them secretly and fly them down to Oaxaca, Mexico. They'd fly them down to Oaxaca, Mexico, to a ranch that was owned by Clint Murchison. Clint Murchison is the son of the of the man who owned the Santa Anita racetrack in California, where where J uh, John Edgar Hoover in in uh, used to go all the time for free and uh, the, there was a ranch that they owned down in Oaxaca, Mexico. This was made the triangular fire team base where they were training a triangular fire team assassination group, these 15 men, to kill Castro and the other Cubans. And this particular base was funded, this becomes important, it was funded by a skim of cash off the casinos in Las Vegas that Marcella out of New Orleans was in charge of. They would skim the money off the casinos, the cash money, so that it couldn't be traced. They would drive it in huge boxes in cars, in the trunks of cars, all the way to Miami, and they would deposit it in the Miami National Bank that was owned by Meyer Lansky. And then they would wire the money to the uh, International Credit Bank in Geneva, Switzerland, owned by a man by the name of Guyon, and then they would wire it down into the Mexican bank, in the Banco Internacional, down in Mexico City, and put it into an account of a man by the name of Ogario, who was an attorney in Mexico City. And this is the place from which all of the costs for the Triangular Fire Team base were all covered by, out of this bank account in the Banco Internacional of an attorney by the name of Ogario. This whole operation was rolling in place when, lo and behold, Richard Nixon did not get elected president in November of 1960, but instead uh, John Kennedy was actually elected and appointed his brother Bobby as the Attorney General, as we all recall. And when they found out that there was this Operation 40 that was going on, attempting to overthrow the, the Castro government, and that Nixon had agreed that as soon as he came into office in January of 1961, they were going to transmute Operation 40 into an actual military invasion of Cuba. They were actually going to send ashore a team of anti-Castro Cubans, and they were going to set up a beachhead uh, at the Bay of Pigs, announce that they were uh, a new freedom-liberated government, and Nixon was going to send in the United States Marine Corps into Cuba to overthrow the Castro government and declare uh, a free government and put Batista back into power and put the mafia back into power to be handling the heroin trade again because it was the income from the heroin trade part of it that was funding the Kuomintang, the KMT, the, the uh, Nationalist Chinese that was all set up by the Central Intelligence Agency. That this was their covert means of funding. This was the plan. Uh, and, but what happened, long story, but what happened is when they messed up at the Bay of Pigs uh, and they, the, the invasion collapsed, Kennedy uh, was upset about this and as you recall, he, he said he was going to stop this kind of operations against Cuba, informed the, the Soviet Union, uh, Khrushchev, that this was his pr mistake, that he allowed this to go forward, and he promised Khrushchev that there would be no more efforts to overthrow the Cuban government. Well, it turns out that was not true either, because all they did in the Kennedy administration was transformed it from Operation 40, they renamed it uh, Operation Mongoose, and ran the Mongoose operation against, uh, against Castro. 
Well, what, but, but the Kennedy brothers, this is extremely important to understand, did not know about the assassination team because the assassination team was not a CIA operation. It is not a government operation. It was done out through this complete back channel by Richard Nixon with Howard Hughes working together with, with Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante. And so the Kennedy brothers didn't know anything about this. But when they continued the operation uh, Mongoose against Castro, Khrushchev became furious that he'd been lied to by this young president, and he began to put missiles, nuclear missiles, into Cuba. And as we all recall, the Cuban Missile Crisis came down in October of 1962, and we came to the very brink of thermonuclear war on that night uh, in, uh, in October. On October 28th, that evening, uh, President Kennedy issued an ultimatum to Khrushchev saying that there was a line drawn in the sea that was a particular line of longitude and that if in fact the, the Russian freighters carrying new missiles crossed that line, we would be technically in a state of war with the Soviet Union. And what happened is on that night, the freighter did in fact cross the line and they had it tracked on real-time uh, satellite by the NSA and they saw that it crossed the line the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military went into session, emergency session, and voted unanimously to go to nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union on that night of October 28th. That would have been the end of the world as we know it. And they voted unanimously to go to first strike because they'd run through this scenario a thousand times and you can't blink and, you know, and, and John Kennedy, when he was told that this vote, he ordered them to stand down. And he said, I will not be the man that does this. And he ordered the stand down of, of that attack. And he, he stood everybody down, went off DEFCOM 3, and he said that he was going to, in fact, reach out to Castro. They were going to establish communications with them now. He sent a, a liaison to talk with Khrushchev, and they were going to try to disassemble the nuclear weapons to stop this thing, because he was confronted directly with the, the moment. Of, of the end of the, of the human species. So what, what happened is, is Kennedy at that time gave the absolute order that all of the operations against Cuba were to stop. And he ordered the shutdown of all five of these paramilitary bases on Star Island and Swan Island and in the Everglades and the two of them at Lake Pontchartrain, ordered them to be shut down. And the fact is, the anti-Castro Cubans that were manning those bases and conducting those paramilitary attacks refused to obey the president. And in fact, in fact, in January of 1963, now this is, remember the October Missile Crisis of 1962, and in November they're ordered to shut down those bases. They refused to do it. And then in January of 1963, that next month, it turns out that Frank Sturgis, who was one of the liaison, along with E. Howard Hunt, to the assassination group of these people, led an attack against Cuba from Star Island. And unknown to anybody until this point tonight, or this afternoon, it turns out that John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, in January of 1963, ordered a full military strike against the island. And they sent in uh, 50 United States Marshals in six helicopter gunships, fully armed with M16 rifles and full military brigade, went in and, and attacked the island and burnt out the, the camp of the island and arrested Sturgis and the other, the other anti-Castro Cubans on that, that island and threatened to prosecute them under the U.S. Neutrality Act for violating the Neutrality Act of attacking uh, a country that the United States was not at war with. But then they released them and figured that that was a shot across the bow and that they all now knew that they were not to do this. The problem is, is that in February, a second attack was, was launched against Cuba from the base in the Everglades. This one under the supervision of E. Howard Hunt. So a second foray was organized by President Kennedy and Bobby as the Attorney General, and they sent in the helicopter gunships, burnt out the base in the Everglades, and arrested all of those men and prosecuted them under the Neutrality Act. It was that act itself that caused the members of the S Force to say, this is over, he's a traitor. He has lied to us, he said he would overthrow this government of Castro, he's now standing us down, 
And the S Force at that moment resolved to kill the president. And when it was June, it was early June of 1960, when, uh, when uh, Bobby Kennedy was informed uh, by uh, William Sheridan, was informed by an FBI officer about the existence of the assassination team. And Bobby was furious about this, and he went and talked with John, and they both ordered the shutdown of the assassination team. The order it shut down. And what happened is on June 8th, this team was attempting one last foray to go in to try to assassinate Castro, pretending that they hadn't gotten the order from the president. And that's what happened on June 8th to June 10th. And that's what brought about that strange event on the night of June 10th when William Pauley stated directly in the presence of, of Dick Billings, the, Washington, the, the Miami bureau chief of Time Life magazine, that they were going to kill the president. And they attempted to kill him in Miami. They were going to kill him in Miami. And uh, they got word that it was, it was too dangerous and the president canceled the trip. And then they killed him in Dallas. And the, as soon as the word went out that they were looking for Lee Harvey Oswald as a suspect in that killing, which, you know, happened basically within an hour of the killing. They were all after this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, and everybody who heard that, who knew about the S-Force, realized that it was the S-Force that had killed the president because Lee Harvey Oswald is the man that the S-Force was setting up to take the fall for killing Castro. And what they had done is they had just done a complete 180 and had set him up and uh, DeMore and Shield got him the job at the, at the Texas Book Depository and they set him up for taking a fall for killing the president. And uh, Tippett was supposed to kill him. The office of the police officer in the Dallas Police Department was sent to find him and to kill him. And so and soon as soon as Oswald saw him, of course, he knew exactly what he'd come for, and so Oswald killed him, shot him dead right in the street. And so this, this series, this, this is what happened, of course, and then as soon as everybody realized that it had been the S-Force that had killed the president, everybody began to cover it up. Everybody began to conceal it, to conceal the existence of the team, uh, to conceal the fact that they were in the field to try to kill Castro. And in fact, it became the paramount thing to have to conceal. So, because what they argued, they argued to Chief Justice Warren in order to get him to chair the Warren Commission, they said, look, we've got to tell you something very secret. And this was Sheridan told him again. He said, look, the fact is, he said, uh, there was an assassination team in the field to kill Castro. And if that ever gets out, the American people are going to think that Castro found out about this and therefore retaliated against the president and it must have been Castro that tried to, to, that killed him and they'll insist that we invade Cuba and if we invade Cuba the Soviet Union is going to attack us and we're going to have a third world war and we're going to destroy the whole world and this is how they designed the conspiracy theory the cover-up theory to get somebody of the caliber of Warren to come in to conceal it they met with uh, Gerald Ford and told Gerald Ford about this, and the one thing that had to be concealed during the entire Warren Commission investigation was the existence of this particular assassination team that was in the field to kill Castro. And it turns out, of course, that's the exact team that killed the president. And that was how the whole thing got concealed. And it becomes very important when you understand that it was Rip Robertson that was the head of the team that was on the boat that night, on the Flying Tiger too, in June 8th to June 10th of 1963, that was the head of the assassination team. And there he is in Daly Plaza on November 22nd of 1963, within seconds of the, fire, of the shots fired, with Grayson Lynch, his assistant, standing right next to him, tipping the hat like this just before the shots rang out. And, uh, and David Morales, the chief shooter, was the one on the grassy knoll that actually fired the fatal shots that killed the president. And there he is in June of 1968, standing in the Ambassador Hotel, along with the guy who was the head of the Cuban student group that was the one that had the fight with Oswald on the street. So what you see has happened here is that this, this cabal that had been put together uh, are the ones that killed the president. And it became critical later because, just as a kind of parenthetical aside, this is what the entire uh, Watergate burglary was all about. Because it turns out that when President Nixon lost the election in 1960, as you know, he ran again in 1968 after Bobby was killed, that Bobby would have won the Democratic nomination, would have won the presidency, 
And they were terrified about Bobby Kennedy coming to office because you know perfectly well the first thing that Bobby Kennedy as the new president would have done was launch a full-scale investigation of the assassination of John. And so Bobby was killed in June of 1968. And with him being eliminated, Hubert Humphrey became the nominee and Richard Nixon beat him. And Richard Nixon became the president in 1968. But when Richard Nixon was running for re-election in 1972, he became terrified because uh, right after he got the nomination in 1972 of June, it turns out the Democratic National Committee selected to be the head of the Democratic National Committee with their offices in the Watergate Hotel, Larry O'Brien. It turns out that Larry O'Brien was for 25 years the chief lobbyist in Washington, D.C. for Howard Hughes. And Nixon became terrified. He said, wait a second. All of a sudden, he's just all of a sudden quit being the, the Washington lobbyist for Howard Hughes after 25 years and has become the head of the Democratic National Committee that's organizing the campaign against me. What if he knows? What if he knows that I'm the one that got Howard Hughes to put together the assassination team, which is the team that actually killed the president? This is the only possible way I can lose the election. And so Nixon orders Jeb, Jeb Magruder to send in the plumbers to wire up the telephones of Larry O'Brien in the Watergate Hotel. And when they got caught in the, in the Watergate Hotel, you may remember, they, when the burglars got arrested and they were taken into custody, they found in the pocket of Bernard Barker a canceled check that was drawn on the Banco Internacional down in Mexico City from an account of a lawyer by the name of Ogario. That's the key to the whole thing. That's what the problem was, is that because they, they couldn't tell anybody else what it is they were looking for in the wiretaps, they had to send in actual people who were part of the S-Force. Those Cubans that were in the hotel in the burglary were part of the S-Force because they knew what they were looking for to determine whether he knew about the assassination team. And because of that, they paid them right out of the same account down in Mexico City in the Banco Internacional uh, and that's where the, that's where, and so that the famous smoking gun conversation that took place on June 23rd of 1972, after the, after the burglars were arrested, you remember that uh, John Dean, who was the legal counsel to President Nixon, and Bob uh, Haldeman, his chief of staff, came into the president in the Oval Office, and it's on the tapes. And uh, John Dean says, Mr. President, I think we've got a problem here. And Nixon says, what is that, John? And he said, well... Just got a call from Pat Gray, who was the new head of the FBI, because Hoover had just died two weeks earlier. And Pat Gray says that uh, they've been asked to investigate uh, this bank down in Mexico City. This is right, right, on, the, right on the tapes uh, in this account where the check in Bernard Barker's pocket was cleared through. And uh, Pat Gray wants to know whether that's going to cause any problem. There's a big, long pause, and Richard Nixon says, uh, John... I want you to go see uh, uh, Vernon Walters and Dick Helms over at the agency, the CIA. And I want you to have them contact the FBI and tell them to get the hell out of this investigation right now. There's a big long pause and John Dean says, well, Mr. President, what, what am I supposed to tell him to say? And he said, you have Vernon Walters and Dick Helms tell the FBI that if they don't get out of this investigation right now, all the Mexico stuff about the Bay of Pigs guys could come out. That's the smoking gun conversation. That's the conversation for which Richard Nixon was impeached for obstructing justice by ordering the Central Intelligence Agency to shut down the investigation. And, uh, and it was that that next day there was scheduled a fellow, a, an FBI agent, the number two man in the office of the FBI uh, by the name of Mark Felt who was deep throat was assigned the next day he was supposed to conduct the interview of the attorney by the name of Ogario down in Mexico City. And he was ordered by Vernon Walters and Dick Helms to stand down and that's what caused him to reach out and contact uh, Bob Woodward and to start to tell him the story about what was going on to, uh, to get rid of the president, to get him out of office.
So this, and, and of course now you see that when Bobby, Bobby had the chance of becoming president, they killed him and they killed John. But it wasn't, it wasn't the CIA that killed John Kennedy. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the FBI that killed John Kennedy. It wasn't, in fact, just the mafia that killed John Kennedy. It was something different than that. But it was a little bit of everything in there. Because I've just told you exactly how the thing happened. And so you have to step back from that and you say, well, what is that? It wasn't the Pentagon killing him because they wanted to, you know, because he was getting set to withdraw all the troops out of Vietnam. You know, and it wasn't the Israeli Mossad that killed him because, you know, Kennedy was going to be attacking Mossad. And, you know, none of those things. It, it is, this is how it happened exactly. And so you look at that complex development of how this whole thing happened. And, and, it's, and it's a little bit like an automobile accident crash. You know, people coming into an intersection and one person is running the orange light and the other person is picking something up off the floor and they crash together and, and people get killed. What happened here is there was absolutely a conspiracy to kill Castro and there became eventually a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy, but it was actually initiated by a low-level group of people in the, in the S Force who were rabid anti-Castro Cubans who will kill you for stepping on their dog's tail. You know, I mean, these are the kind of people that, that, that they are. And so that they developed the desire to kill the president. When they killed him, the other people who realized who it was that had done it had all their own completely different reasons for being terrified about this ever being revealed because it would look like the CIA killed the president or it would look like Richard Nixon killed the president, neither one of which was true. So this is, this is the nature of, of that uh, conspiracy and what it, what it actually looked like. And so, so what, does that, what does that tell us? What does that tell us about how conspiracies really happen and how they don't happen? And how, what does that say to us about the present state of the cover-up conspiracy with regard to the UFO phenomenon, which is by great measure, the most important of all of the conspiracies and cover-ups that are going on in the United States uh, and in the world because of the absolutely dramatic implications of the existence of our having contact with an extraterrestrial civilization, the, the existence of technologies that could help solve you know, virtually all of the major problems of our planet uh, to eliminate the global greenhouse gas uh, dangers to eliminate this huge catastrophe that's coming toward us now of raising the levels of the sea perhaps 40 inches, you know, uh, eliminating over half of all of our, our potable water on the planet by melting the polar ice caps at both poles and, and, uh, and contaminating with salt water the freshwater aquifers uh, along the seacoast of, of our world. You know, there, there's all kinds of extraordinarily important reasons why this particular uh, cover-up ranging all the way from the most practical in, in prosaic to the most profound of really coming to understand what a civilization that has uh, over perhaps a million years of, of advances beyond where we are might be able to share with us. Uh, so that what, what I want to do is I, I want to articulate to you what, what I think is going on. Now, so, some of you who may have heard me talk before in that uh, Colonel Ware referred to it earlier, is that you know, I had pointed out that, in, in, in my opinion, the response that an individual has to their encounter with the UFO phenomenon is, in fact, a direct function of that person's worldview. So that if, in fact, a person is a, an adherent to the second paradigm worldview, and I don't want to be too confused, but, but there's an entire octave of worldviews a complete set of eight worldviews. Now that's not coincidental. And just like it's not coincidental that we as a human species are able to physically discern only eight primary colors in the, uh, the spectrum of the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and, and violet. And everything that is ultraviolet, uh, we can't discern with our own faculties. And everything that is, is uh, below the red spectrum the, the uh, infrared, uh, uh, we can't see either. But our world is made up of these 
these a set of seven primary colors. But we know what happens that if you take all seven primary colors and you put them together in a set, is they become crystal clear white light. In the same way that we can, we can only discern the seven primary tones. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. And then the, the last do is the end of the octave set. And that you have a full octave. And we know that we can discern octave shifts. And that we can discern the relationship between octaves. And that becomes the base of music for us. Okay? But the same thing is true. We are, in fact, a function our, our physiognomy is, in fact, a function of the planet on which we were gestated. So it's not surprising that we, too, are, are products of this octave perception system in the same way that other things are in, in our universe. Uh, and so that, so that what we have is we have eight worldviews, an octave set of worldviews, and they have been arbitrarily numbered, you know, one through eight. Uh, in, in the first paradigm worldview is the classic uh, animist, uh, primitive, uh, shamanic worldview of the Native American people and Aboriginal people. The, the second paradigm worldview is the dialectical worldview, the kind of fundamentalist worldview of us against them and black and white and good and bad. And, uh, and it, it's predicated upon a cosmology that actually believes in the eternal return that the, our physical universe, they believe, in the second paradigm worldview is expanding and uh, all the way out to the point where every ultimately irreducible uh, quantum field of matter will stand separate and apart from every other one. But at that point, the impetus that has been imposed upon them by the Big Bang will have been completely spent and it will stand in a state of stasis and the degree of attraction that every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire universe has one for another will at that point be superior and will start to draw back together again and will then collapse back together to form quarks and muons and neutrinos and electrons and atoms and molecules and compounds and mixtures and planets and stars and galaxies again. And so that this whole thing will happen until they all contract back together to the point where every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe will be in direct physical contact with every other one. And that the entire universe will be the size of the head of a pin. At which point the polarity will be switched immediately and they will all repel each and every other one. Not an explosion from the center out, but every single ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire physical universe will immediately repel every other one, causing the Big Bang again. And that this will oscillate like this, like a heartbeat, for eternity. And that's the second paradigm worldview. And that's where they get this dialectical perception underlying everything. And uh, <clears throat> so that there's, there's a whole range of these worldviews. And each and every one of the worldviews has its own completely separate and definitively different cosmology. For example, the first paradigm cosmology believes that when that point is reached where, as we know, the universe is expanding out and away from the locus of the Big Bang and all matter is disintegrating pursuant to its rate of atomic breakdown, each element. And that, that point is going on and on and there will in fact come a point where every ultimately irreducible integer of matter in the entire universe, which would be a, an inchoate quantum field, will stand separate and apart from every other one the adherents to the first paradigm worldview believe that at that point the impetus imposed upon them by the Big Bang will continue to push them out and away from each other and that the entire physical universe will disintegrate. It's called the entropy theory of the universe and that it will all disintegrate into infinite and eternal space. That's kind of a bummer. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the ultimate kind of pessimistic view of things, but what it causes them to believe that there is no ultimate referent for good and bad. It's all just going away. And so therefore, there is no such thing as, as real value. And so therefore, you, the, it generates kind of an authoritarian worldview that persons have to assert power and impose upon reality a, a set of meanings because there are none really. And so therefore, some authoritative or authoritarian leader has to assert power and it, it sets up a paradigm, a first paradigm worldview where you have warlords and chieftains, etc. But, 
This, so what I'm saying is, is that these, these worldviews going all the way from the right, extreme right of the first paradigm worldview to the second paradigm dialectical worldview to the third paradigm existential worldview to the fourth paradigm scientific, logical, positivist, materialist worldview, the classic Newtonian, Cartesian worldview that is the, the champion of the scientific world. And then there's the fifth paradigm worldview, which is the platonic worldview of idealism. And then the sixth paradigm worldview, which is the worldview of quantum physics, the one that we're opening on to right now, the, the new, the, what we're calling the new worldview, is this quantum worldview that since 1923 to 1926, where Max Planck and the others discovered the quantum uh, mechanical world, that this new worldview is the one that's opening now. And then there's a seventh paradigm worldview, which is the classic theistic worldview that believes that exterior to the, the physical cosmos, they're exterior to the physical limited boundaries of the physical cosmos that is made up of the sum total of all the ultimately irreducible integers of matter in the universe, that beyond that is an infinite and eternal sea of completely undifferentiated consciousness. And that it is the source of the material universe which it enfolded into being out of consciousness. This is the classic seventh paradigm theistic worldview. And then there's the eighth paradigm worldview, which is the post-contact worldview. When we have actually confirmed and established contact with an extraterrestrial civilization and learn how to travel to the stars and how to travel to other galaxies, that this is going to be the worldview that we're opening onto, at which point our human species will take the next full step in evolution. And that we will, in fact, evolve from, from Homo sapien to Homo divinus. And that we will actually be as much unlike Homo sapiens at that point as we are now from Homo erectus. So that, that's, what's, that's what's in the offing right now. And so you can see how important this issue of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization is because it, it offers to bring us beyond the highest paradigm that we have now, or worldview, which is our classic theistic worldview, even well beyond the mere quantum worldview that we're sort of coming onto linearly right now. So it's extraordinarily important that we take great care in husbanding and midwifing this worldview. And that, that's really what we're here for. I mean, the, 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 the fact is that we're not here just to look for, you know, knocking on the side of a UFO or to you know, take pictures of a UFO. We're here because of that extraordinarily high calling that we all hear of looking toward the, the, the ultimate worldview of our human family because it will be the, the closing of the octave of the worldviews to which we have access in our present incarnation as Homo sapiens. It, it will be the opportunity we have then to make an entire octave jump into the next octave of being, at which point we will function at the lowest manifestation of the worldview of the next octave of being. And, that, and that's what we're doing. So you can see that the, it's important to understand that, in, in my opinion, what's happened is because of the, the contacts that uh, began, as, as we all know, the, the, the principal contacts, uh, setting aside the, the sporadic contacts that have gone on down through the centuries that we all are quite aware of, that, that after the explosion of the nuclear, first nuclear bomb, the first atomic bomb uh, at White Sands uh, in 1945, even prior to the explosions in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that we began to have these contacts <coughs> from these vehicles that would manifest and they were all around White Sands and they were all around New Mexico and they were searching around and following the V2 rocket experiments and all the things that were going on. It, it becomes quite evident that what happened is, in my judgment, that the, the extraterrestrial civilization realized that we had crossed into a point where we were threatening to terminate the entire evolution of our human family. We had touched into the technology that was going to be our own source of self-destruction. And I, I raise that because we now know that it was on the night of October 28th of 1962 when but for the decision of one specific individual, 
we would have, in fact, totally annihilated ourselves because the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States government had voted to go to nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union. And if that simple flick of the wrist had happened from John Kennedy and said, launch, we would all be gone. And we would not be here talking about this. So we've, we've, we've overcome that particular moment of dire threat. But that was the moment of dire threat that basically instigated the, the major uh, bout of contacts that we began having with the extraterrestrial beings. And so what's happening now that we have this entire set of questions that are in front of us is, well, what happened there when they reached out to us to actually attempt to uh, keep this from happening? We know, we know uh, of, the, of the contacts. You, you remember back in 1967, the contacts up at the Nike Zeus missile sites up in Montana where the UFOs came and they shut down all ten Nike Zeus missile sites in two different Nike Zeus missile bases there. So they're perfectly capable of shutting down these particular devices. We know that now. So the, the, so the question is, is well, what, what, what are the beings up to? What are they doing? What kind of contact have they had with our, our United States government? What kind of contact have they had with the Soviet Union? Uh, and I, I've had the privilege of, of chairing the uh, strategic initiative to identify the new post-Cold War paradigm, working with President Gorbachev, uh, at the State of the World Forum, which Colonel Ware touched upon. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to sit down with the presidents of, of 90 different foreign countries and to talk with them about this issue of the UFO stuff and how important they thought it was. It was the first conversation I ever had with Gorbachev when I got an opportunity to sit down with him. And, uh, and he referred me directly to his uh, foreign minister who put me in touch with the man uh, who told me all about the contacts and stuff that they'd had in the Soviet Union. Uh, with, with these beings. And so that uh, I think that this is an extraordinarily important issue. It is, as I've said before, I think it's the most important single public policy issue confronting our human family today because it is filled with promise. It is filled with the potential of opening onto an entire new world, uh, the entire next step in our biological evolution as a species. But it's important to remember how terrified the guardians of the present worldview are by the threat of this. There's, there's an old Sufi saying that when, when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. And this is what I believe happened when this extraordinary opportunity presented itself of the contact with an extraterrestrial civilization because of our nation state, a, a comparatively primitive organizing mechanism to begin with. <clears throat> but our nation state, seeing itself in fundamental dialectical conflict with the Soviet Union, perceived this as simply a, a two things. One, an opportunity to get a great advantage in having a new weapon system to be able to defeat the Soviet Union, and secondly, perceived these beings as a potential threat. They perceived them as the ultimate other. They, and and that's, the, that's the fundamental function of the second paradigm dialectical worldview, is you encounter the, a different being and you perceive them as a threat, as it's a projection of the ultimate other onto them. And, so that I think it, both things happened with regard to the major uh, American military complex. They perceived these beings as an ultimate threat. They invaded our airspace. We had no capacity to counter them. So I believe that they began to, that the leaders of the, the American government at that time began to try to seize these vehicles. As you know, they began to try to shoot them down with radar beams and uh, they tried to develop special weapon systems to shoot these, these vehicles down to capture them to try to get at the technology to, to understand the technology so we could develop a new weapon system with which to become the all-powerful source of power on the planet. And that's, that's, the, that's the sinful motive that basically has been driving our, the leaders of our nation state since the original encounter, both to develop the weapon to vanquish the Soviet Union and to assert our hegemony over the entire world, 
but also to try to develop some type of a weapon system to be able to challenge the actual extraterrestrial civilization itself. And this, this constitutes the, the greatest single threat to our entire future, to, to have people of this particular mindset uh, governing our policies so that they are planning to try to vanquish this extraterrestrial civilization, to shoot down their vehicles, to establish a dialectical warlike dynamic with them, to carry this primitive worldview out into the stars. And that is, that is the worldview that will not be allowed off the planet. That worldview cannot be exported into the stars. And uh, I believe that the extraterrestrial civilization, whatever its particular configuration, whether there is in fact a galactic confederation or whether there is some loose association of the different uh, planetary systems that these people come from, that they realize what a terrible threat uh, our species represents in our presently comparatively unevolved state. And so therefore there has been this entire deterrent to our being able to really travel to the stars. It's why I believe it's taken us so long to move from you know, putting people on the moon to all of a sudden stopping putting people on the moon. To not in fact really going forward with the, with the space platform at an adequate rate. Of not really placing people on Mars. That, that what's happened here is I believe that there is a a communication that is coming to us from the people of the extraterrestrial civilization holding us back from this step out into space and at the same time attempting to facilitate our evolution in a positive, constructive way without over-interfering in our normal biological processes. So I believe that that's the, that's the nature of the, in a sense, two-sided conspiracy there's a conspiracy on the part of the leaders of our military industrial complex to continue to try to, to capture the, the technology and to establish a weapon set of systems for hegemony on our planet and to be able to militarily defeat the extraterrestrial people. And there's a conspiracy, in a sense, on the part of the extraterrestrials to keep us confined to our, our planetary system, at least, uh, allowing us to evolve in a, in a more constructive way. So that, that I believe that one of the most important things that we can do, what I was doing with, with Dr. Mack when, when, when John was unfortunately killed, we were attempting to actually train contactees to, because we discovered through John's work and others' work, that, as you know, you, you've discovered that when a person has a contact like this, where they are actually taken aboard a vehicle, it turns out that that's not the first time that it's happened to them. That it's part of a pattern that's happened to them. And, and John relates that in, in, his, in his books, that we, we discovered that to be true. So we knew that the people who had experienced a number of different contacts were going to have future contacts. So what we were doing is attempting to train the people to engage in holotropic breathing, this, uh, the, the, the breathing that, uh, that John was using. It's not hypnosis, it's just a, ma a manner of, of calming one's whole system down. And that, uh, that we were attempting to get people to be trained that when they knew this was getting ready to happen again, because as you know, people can tell when it's getting ready to happen again. They start to get that feeling. There's this whole kind of ionizing field that comes around them and that they know it's happening. And if they start to do the holotropic breathing that Stanislav Graf developed, they can calm themselves. And instead of panicking when the beings appear, one can just say, okay, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> Stay calm here. Because the reason that they freeze people, the reason that they paralyze people, is because they're afraid of us. Because when we get panicked, we get very violent and, and we're big and strong. Uh, and so that they, they have to do that for their own protection. But once they realize that people are in a state of calm and are open to have communications with them, people can talk with them and say, look, let, let's, ha let's have an intelligent conversation here. You know, what can I do? What can we... So we, we were attempting to kind of open diplomatic communications with them directly, which is, of course, in fact, how we did it with the Soviet Union. That a, a very dear friend of mine, Dr. James Garrison, 
the different Jim Garrison, uh, was the head of the Gorbachev Foundation, and he was on my staff when I was general counsel for the United States Jesuit headquarters. Jim Garrison was my staff person on the nuclear weapons disarmament issue. And we sent him to the Soviet Union. That's how he met Gorbachev. Uh, and that's the conversations he had with Gorbachev about having to eliminate the nuclear weapons. And it was part of the consideration that Gorbachev engaged in in deciding that he was going to, to shut down the Soviet Union as a major threat uh, to the world. And that be, be, because of this, we, we know that there is a process by means of which you can open diplomatic channels directly to potential adversaries. And so we began a thing of, of citizen diplomacy, going back and forth to the Soviet Union, getting to meet scientists, getting to meet politicians, getting to meet business people, etc. And we opened up that line of communications to the Soviet Union that actually freed up Gorbachev and, and other, other people that were working with him uh, to open on to normalizing relations with the, with the West. And so that, that's the plan that, that, that I'm part of, is trying to open direct communications with the, the people from the extraterrestrial civilization, to establish dialogue with them, and to have them be able to understand, as they do, that not all people on our planet are adherents to the second paradigm, militarist, dialectical, confrontational, warlike worldview that we have people in all the different paradigms. And that what, what we're in is, is that I, I think that the paradigm that we need to look to for the immediate future is what I call the sixth paradigm worldview, this new worldview of quantum physics that is opening to us. Uh, William Teller has written about this, the, uh, the, beginning, of a, the beginning of a new, uh, new worldview. I, I think, in fact, I saw some copies of his book out there uh, where, where they're actually talking about trying to integrate in the discoveries that were made between 1923 and 1926 in the field of quantum physics into our worldview to actually modify our Cartesian Newtonian worldview with the insights of the, of the, new, of the new worldview and that I believe that this is the next step that we can take clearly and I think that it will become the worldview that is characteristic of virtually all of the people that are in the, what is called the UFO community. The, the, those of us that are in this worldview, uh, I think, need to understand what the full template really is. So I would, I would suggest that you look into this, this, the sixth paradigm worldview of quantum physics, and understand that at the base of every worldview is a certain set of assumptions about physics and about it's their cosmology. The cosmology, as I said, there's the oscillating universe, there's the ultimately expanding universe, there's the stable universe, there's, there's, uh, but it, it has to do with understanding what the laws of physics are that are functioning and what the relationship is between the laws of physics and our biological evolution. Because there's obviously something going on. I mean, obviously, you know, the, uh, the eyeball did not evolve uh, just at random. You know, I mean, that, you know, like, like th thinking, this, people have made some references before, but, you know, thinking that the eyeball just happened as a result of a bunch of random mutations is like thinking that you can take, you know, a, a full warehouse that's got all of the subcomponent elements of a 747 and you hit it with an infinite number of tornadoes and one of them is going to build a 747. You know, I mean, that isn't going to happen. Uh, there, there, is a, there, is a, there are a set of principles in guiding uh, laws that are functioning beneath our evolution. And Teilhard de Chardin talks about this a lot. Uh, and that, that, so if, if you read Teilhard de Chardin, Teilhard de Chardin is the, is the articulator of the mode of spiritual expression of the sixth paradigm. And people like Teller are the physicist for the, uh, for the sixth paradigm. There's another, there's another fellow by the name of, uh, uh, what's his name, Saul Paul, uh, Saul Paul Sirag, Sir Sirag, yeah, there is another, another physicist who's working in these particular areas. But what I'm suggesting to you in, in the closing moments here is that there is a way in which you can get access to the kind of materials that will help you clarify a lot of inchoate ideas that you have at the present time, that you can feel it just, just beyond your reach and that you can begin to look at some of these materials and begin to see, ah, there's the full template of what the full worldview is going to look like, this new sixth paradigm, new paradigm worldview. Uh, and I, I happen to now be the, the president of the New Paradigm Institute, 
which is out in Santa Cruz, California, and it is a 501c3 uh, progeny of the State of the World Forum of Gorbachev in the, the hearings that we held at the end of the Cold War, attempting to lift up this new worldview, to articulate this new worldview, and to understand that we have to, we have to lift up away from getting trapped in these conspiracy theories. Though conspiracies are real, the, the conspiracies tend to be a function of the second paradigm dialectical worldview. And one is attempting to say, there's all these bad guys that are all part of one big, huge, kind of amorphous mass, and uh, they're in dialectical struggle with all of us good people. What I'm suggesting to you in closing is that that is far too simplistic an analysis. And it, it's a function of a worldview that is extremely outdated. And so what I'm asking is that you look into this newer worldview, the sixth paradigm, new paradigm worldview of quantum physics, of holographic subsets of reality that we find ourselves in, and that through this pathway we reach out to the stars, through this pathway we reach out to our friends in the extraterrestrial civilization, and through this pathway we reach out to each other so that we can come to understand more thoroughly what the cosmology is of this worldview, what its theory of the evolution of human consciousness is, what its mode of spiritual expression is, and ultimately what its social form will be so that we will know what the new world looks like while it's in the offing. And that way, we can all become co-conspirators <laughs> in breathing together to conspiratu, that we can all breathe together and breathe in sync with our sisters and brothers from the stars. We can breathe together with our sisters and brothers in our movement and that we can open on to this new world. Thank you very, very much for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So I good things to talk with you about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a, yeah, we, we, yes.